Welcome to the Bethel Church Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message by Pastor Bill Johnson. For more information about this podcast and other resources, visit Bethel.com. Matthew chapter 11. I've I've got some stuff uh, that's been stirring up in my heart for quite a while, actually, and just really finally felt the liberty this morning to to talk with you about it. We're going to look at at a very tender place in Jesus' life and ministry. Uh, Jesus administered people differently. There was no cookie-cutter approach to people. Uh, For one person, sell everything, give to the poor, follow me. Uh, To another person, they just leave their nets. To another person, he responded completely different and uh, was just uh, um, the, the woman caught in adultery, go and sin no more. So it's different. It's not that the requirements are different for every person. It's Jesus had the ability to go right to the core of who a person was and speak to the supreme heart issue. So he's always targeting the center of who we are and what's valuable and important to us. So this is a passage that is known for one of those extreme tender moments and uh, and has been a real standard for us. I want you to read with me uh, Matthew chapter 11. I'm going to start in verse 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. This, um, let me talk to you just a minute about this verse. It's not our subject today, but I I, I would like for you to get a bonus on on this passage uh, because of its importance. Let's look at it again. Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Oftentimes people ask, how can I increase in in just my revelation knowledge of scripture? And there's so many things you can do. John chapter seven teaches um, that one of the things is to obey what you already know. That actually attracts revelation. But this is uh, very, very profound because it's completely unexpected. Being a good steward of what you know makes common sense. That would attract more. But this is the key to revelation is being childlike. He saved his best insights of revelation for babes. It's important to see because babe has nothing to do with age. It has to do with simplicity of heart, simplicity of devotion. This is an upside down kingdom. If you want to be exalted, you have to go low. If you want to receive, you have to give. If you want to live, you've got to die. It's an upside down kingdom. And in this one where we would think the most complicated parts of the kingdom would be revealed to quote unquote, the wise and the mature, Jesus is saying, no, the best is saved for the children. The best is saved for those who have childlike heart as they approach the Lord. All right, let's move on in the story. Verse 26. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Just good to make a mental note, Jesus is the continuous ongoing revelation of the Father. If you see him, you see the Father. Here's our three verses that uh, I want us to look at today. Verse 28, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, for you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. The picture here is vital uh, for us to catch or this will make no sense. If you can picture a young oxen yoked to a larger, bigger oxen, oxen you'll, you'll get the picture. It's these big, heavy wood yokes that, that harness the power of these two animals to plow a field, accomplish whatever they're supposed to accomplish. Jesus says, you're yoked to me. I'm gonna carry the weight of this. And because you're smaller, you don't need to carry the weight. You just need to walk alongside me and my yoke for you is going to be light. It's it's going to be easy. It's it's not going to be uh, burdensome for you. That's the life I have for you. It's an amazing statement. The problem is, is many of us find we're in a lot of pain with the yoke that we're in. Now, if I'm yoked to Jesus and he is carrying the weight of this yoke and it's heavy for me, why is it heavy? If I'm feeling pain from the, the, the weight of this yoke, 
How could I possibly feel pain if he is carrying the weight, the brunt of it? It's only because I'm going in a different direction. Listen carefully. There are many times the Lord yokes us with other people and it causes pain to us, but it's only because we're not going in the direction that is needed by being yoked with them. I've seen good people in their marriages fall apart simply because they could not cooperate with the other one and the yoke became burdensome, heavy, and painful. And the answer was to get rid of the person who causes the pain. It may be in a personal relationship area. It may be in ministry. It might be where you work. But Jesus is interested at something much more than our accomplishments and achievements. Now, I for one believe that he is interested in us doing something, accomplishing something. We see the story, uh, the, the, the servants with the minas, sums of money, the servants with talents. They were to invest to bring increase. God is interested in increase in all that he's given us. All that we, he's given us, all that we are, is to be invested for his honor, for his glory, to bring in a harvest for him. That's important to him. But there's one thing he has in his heart that is of greater value, and that is me becoming like his son, Jesus. All right, let's, let's make this practical. From what I hear, I am responsible around here. That's what I've heard. I don't think it's a rumor. I think it's actually true. I am responsible. And because I'm responsible, um, I have a lot of power. I don't mean power of the Holy Spirit. I mean power to make choices. I can say, no, you're not gonna do that. Yes, you're going to do that. And if somebody causes me pain, I actually have the ability to organize them right out my, right outside of my life. <laughs> Which is sounding really inviting right now at the moment. It's just sounding like wisdom perhaps. Here, here's what I wanna get to. As you increase in favor, in power, it becomes easier and easier to remove the people from your life that God has yoked you with to make you more like Jesus. <laughs> the more powerful you become, the more options you have in arranging who will be in your life and who won't. I intentionally, this is gonna sound a little weird to you, forgive me. I intentionally keep people of pain in my life because I know I've not arrived. You know how they put rocks in a rock tumbler? and they knock all the sharp edges off and they all become smooth. Listen, none of us have it all together and we actually need people that in relationship expose where we have sharp edges. God's main ambition for you and me is to be like Jesus. And the problem with maturity, let me, let me rephrase it. The problem with blessing is you can insulate yourself from your own need for change. And so I can create around me, if I want to, an environment where no conflict, no pain, nothing will ever come to me. I can create that environment because I have the power to do that. The problem is, is God has sovereignly yoked me with people that cause me pain. And that... Chris, Chris thinks I'm talking about him. I'm just not even going there. No, sir. He puts us together with the people we need. He sovereignly yokes us. Sometimes it's in ministry responsibility. Sometimes it's in work. You may volunteer to help at the hospital or, or a little league coach and, and you have got a couple of coaches that you work with that just irritate you to pieces. It doesn't matter what context we apply this. The point is, is the more powerful you become, the more tempting it is to remove from yourself anyone who exposes where you have weakness. 
And we don't call it that. We don't, we don't say, they're causing me pain, which is exposing my weakness. We say, they have a huge weakness that is causing me problems. <laughs> Any, anybody else with me on that one? They have issues. And I'm telling you, they have serious issues. And I don't know how much longer I can endure their issues. So here's what happens. People come and they say, Bill, I just, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I, I just, I can't handle this any longer. I can't handle this any longer. And of course, I'm always trying to, to bring comfort, encouragement, change situations that I can change. But here's the bottom line, just between you and me, absolutely raw, gut level honest. Some of those situations are arranged by God because you're not quite who you think you are. And having that person in your life will bring you to a place of absolute honesty and dependency. Here's what happens. I have a, a, a situation come up, a conflict, a, a, a betrayal, whatever it might be. And I'm just, oh, I'm so troubled by it. And this has happened to me too many times to count. I'm troubled by it. I can't sleep at night. I just, ah, oh, this person is so important to me. This happened, that happened. And I can't sleep. I get up at night and I just, I just go and pray. And I, 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 I go and just walk and pray, cry out to God. I used to go down to the church in Weaverville. I'd just go in there and pray and just cry out to God. And, and after a while, some relief would come and I, would, I, and I would have this insight, for example. I would say, well, you know, this person is a real gift to me or this person has such great strengths. Uh, sometimes I'll say, oh God, thank you. I never have to question their love for their family. Or God, I never have to question their devotion to, to be faithful and to be true. And I look for the things that are right in their life and I begin to give thanks until there's a real faith that floods my heart. Suddenly, that problem doesn't cause me pain anymore. anymore. Why? Because I moved to fit the yoke I'm in. I moved to fit the yoke I'm in. I'm in, I'm in a yoke and it's a God-assigned yoke. And you, you, you find your place in that. It may seem like punishment. It's not. It's, it's the very gift of God to bring us into the likeness of Christ. And so he puts us in this context where we learn to walk in this environment. We learn to walk in this friendship, in this marriage, in this workplace, whatever it might be. We learn to walk in this environment by continual thanksgiving and learning to rejoice. Paul said it in Thessalonians, I mentioned it a few weeks ago, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. My inability to give thanks in a given situation only reveals I've not yet won the battle over my thoughts. <laughs> We're supposed to rule and reign with Christ. That doesn't mean dominate the planet. That means effectively serve, bringing out the best in every environment. So if, if I can't rule over my thoughts, what kind of influence am I gonna have ruling and reigning with Christ? The battle is first right here. Secondly, it's right here. Rejoice always. My inability to find joy, to choose joy in any given situation only reveals my inability to find victory over my emotions. These two challenges are absolutely the key to yoke adjustment. Yep, yoke adjustment happens through thankfulness. So, sometimes, I, I, sometimes in the middle of the day, it just hits me, oh, just like us. Somebody just gut punched me. And I just go, and I'll walk on the property. I'll be at my house. I'll walk around the house. The point is, is I just get alone with God and I read until he speaks to me. I take, take the word of God and I just read. And then he'll, he'll vent, I can take you to places, geographical locations where I met with God and I was there in tears. I was there in pain, wondering why this was happening, why that was happening, why this betrayal took place, why this thing didn't happen the way I thought it should and crying out to the Lord. And I read on the pages of scripture, his promise to me and suddenly, his word gives me a yoke adjustment. And suddenly this yoke that I thought was put on me by other people becomes the most liberating thing to carry because I'm now walking in tandem with the one who called me to walk with him. And in doing so, learning to be more Christ-like in my behavior and my response. Amen. 
some, some of us in this room would never pray if there was never a problem. And even if you have the discipline of praying when there's no problems, many find it hard to pray out of passion when there's no problem. Pain gives birth to passionate prayer. Hope is supposed to. Pain gives birth to passionate prayer, as I heard someone say recently. Hope is supposed to. Hope is supposed to be that which possesses the heart, if you will, of a person to pray with great passion. Why? Prayers that move you, move him. Prayers that don't you, move you, don't move him. It doesn't mean they have to be long or loud. It just means they have to be honest, authentic, and involve all of us. And passionate prayer is one of the things that brings the hand of God more forcefully into broken situations than anything else I can think of. It's the passionate cry to the Lord. And when you're in pain because, oh, this job that I have is just, listen, let me just insert here. If you're married and you're in an abusive situation, this isn't for you. Just get out of it. Just get out. This, this, this is a principle of working with other believers where the Lord is adjusting our life by the values, behaviors of people around us. And quite frankly, every time, if I choose, if I choose to honor the relationship with this partner, even though I don't get to accomplish all that was in my heart to accomplish because this relationship came first, something is brought before the Lord in my value for unity that exalts him above everything else. His celebration for my priority of unity that glorifies him over personal achievement, over personal liberty, over me having my own way, speaks volumes to him in a way that is uh, almost unparalleled. I've tried to work with this philosophy for quite a while now, that if you wanna catch the attention of a king, do so by treating his daughter well. For me, that's my wife and many others, but it's the way that I care for her is the way I catch the attention of a king. Now let's take that down a level. The scripture says we're to submit ourselves to one another in the fear of Christ. I actually, if, if I don't fear God in you, then I do not see you for who you are. <laughs> Ooh, let's have a drink to that one. Yeah. You too can have one of these bottles. They won't let me bring brand names up here anymore because it gets broadcast. So now we have our own brand, right? Shameless, shameless promotions. <laughs> it's not a new water company. Just, just so you know, just, just a bottle. Anytime we have a spiritual dysfunction and we give it a virtuous name, we give it permission to stay and increase. And there are often times in relationships where there will be suspicions, jealousies, resentments, whatever it might be. And of course, hardly any believer I know would call it for what it is. It's uh, discernment. Uh, it's just my prophetic uh, gifting. It's my personality, which is a great way to hide dysfunction. Just call it a personality. <laughs> then, then you just you 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 just create the capital city for dysfunction. Just call it my personality. 
I believe that Jesus is interested in our personality, but he knows who we really are. When he says, shout for joy, barren one, he doesn't say shout for joy. All of you that are extroverts and, and all of you that are rather quiet and reserved, you know, just think happy thoughts. I'm good. I'm good. He, know who, he knows who he's made us to be. So when he gives us a directive of any kind, it's always so that we can step fully into our design. It's never to violate our identity. It's always to step fully into our design. So while he will not violate my personality in the sense of my true identity, who he's made me to be, he will oftentimes put me in situations to expose to me, if I'm willing to learn, expose to me what's in my thinking, what's in my behavior that he has nothing to do with and he wants it gone. He wants it changed. And so he puts me together with people that rub the wrong way. It's called God's gift. <laughs> Dick Mills used to tell us, turn to the person next to you and tell them, God loves you too much to leave you the way you are. <laughs> that was always an edifying, encouraging word to us. <laughs> so the Lord puts us in situations and sometimes, you know, we wake up in the middle of the night as I've already stated, and I get up and I pray for an hour, two hours. I just can't get back to sleep. I get along with the Lord. Finally, I hear that word, that verse, whatever it might be. Peace comes to my soul. I go to bed and I think, man, this person is causing me so much problems. Not realizing maybe that was the goal. Maybe that's what he was looking for. For a son to take very inconvenient time when it was very sacrificial and to cry out of true passion and get a kingdom solution, a kingdom answer. And the end result is that yoke that was causing so much pain. Actually, I don't, I don't feel it now. Why? I don't know. I, I, I stayed up for a couple hours and prayed. And he spoke. And I don't understand, but I know it's going to be okay. And then three days later, it happens again. Why? Because you're not perfect yet. All of us are in this place of together choosing and preferring one another. Sometimes I have to sacrifice my personal dreams and agendas. Now, I hope you take this in the right spirit when I say I'm a powerful person. I'm, I'm trying to be lighthearted in my position. I can make sure that every one of my dreams get fulfilled, but that's not what I'm here for. I'm, I'm not in that position. I'm not in this position for that. I'm actually here to hear the dreams of the people around me. I'm here to catch them. That's why, that's why I don't give strong job descriptions is because I wanna see a dream develop. I wanna see someone in motion that starts to burn for something. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested, we have things that have to be done, but I hope you understand, I'm looking to see people explode in who God made them to be and to become something, become something that God always intended for them to be. And so we create this environment where that's a possibility, but this environment also creates a lot of rubbing the wrong way because that's the nature of the game. And it's the nature of my need. I actually need people that don't think like me. I need people that don't handle stuff the way I handle it. I need, I, I love, I love uh, travel. Uh, my favorite place on the whole planet is right here, Reading. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else thankful for the firefighters this week? Thank you, Lord. I'm very thankful. I'm very glad to be here. This is my favorite place. But one of the privileges of travel is I, I get to see churches all over the world that are so different from us and yet they are so anointed and blessed by God. It's so important to realize, man, oh, I need this group of people. I need this leader in my life. He thinks different than I do, but I need it. I need his voice. I need his example. I step into his congregation. Whenever I go somewhere, I'm never there 
to, to, for my agenda. I'm always there just to support the person who's in charge that invited me, to support their dream, their vision. And I love just sitting there watching, watching what they've done, what they've accomplished. It's, it's beautiful because it's so easy to get dialed into our little world and think we're it and we're not it. We're a spot on the map, but at least we're a spot where we get to contribute. You know, Randy Clark says it best. He says, every stream thinks they're the river. Yeah, that's, that's sadly true. But at least we're a stream. At least we're, we're a stream. And I'm glad that we get to contribute to what God's doing. I'm so thankful for that. Here's something that I want you to consider. I, I, uh, I fly a lot um, and my airline uh, likes me. And, and I'm thankful. It's certain privileges you get. If uh, when I land at certain airports, uh, there'll be somebody right outside the plane. When I get off, they'll have a sign up. It says, Mr. Johnson. And, and I walk with them onto the tarmac. I don't go into the airport with, with the rest of the sheep. I, so, that's bad, that's bad. That was a joke though. I go down onto the tarmac into the Mercedes and they drive me to my next gate. Hallelujah. Occasionally, I've, I've gotten off a plane and it's, it's like a real tight connection. And there'll be somebody there saying, Mr. Johnson, we've got to get you through this crowd quickly. They're holding the plane and we'll, we'll just run. You know what happens when you're treated like that? When you have a tight connection and they're the, not there? What's happening? Don't they know who I am? Don't they understand I've got 10 minutes to get to the other side of the airport? What kind of organization is this? It's true. Blessing. Here it is. Take your biggest problem, put it right in front of you. The biggest aggravation in your life, put it right in front of you. Now listen to me. Don't ever forget this. There are millions of people that would gladly take your biggest problem if they could also have your greatest privilege. There's income and there's income tax. In a good nation, your income will always be greater than your income tax. I'm not gonna talk today about the rest. <laughs> but seriously, he puts us in situations where there's extreme benefit, but it's also painful. There's a tax to pay. If I only see the tax I pay, I will be disgruntled, complain. I want to distance myself from the people that cause this pain, not realizing I'm in development, I'm in process. This is income tax. There are millions of people that would take your biggest problem if they could only have your greatest privilege. There are millions that would love to sit right where you're sitting. And that is true. So what do we do? We come face to face with the fact that we are blessed beyond reason. We are favored by the Lord. And because I'm favored, I have to use that favor for the welfare of others or it's misused favor. If at any point the favor is used for self-promotion to insulate me from pain, to insulate me from problems or challenges, then I've misused the favor. The favor is to be used for the promotion of the gospel, number one, the strength and empowerment of the people around me. This is a mandate from the Lord. There is no option here. If I choose to insulate me from the, from the people that God yoked me with, then what happens? I have delayed my own development, my own maturing process. I've put off far into the future my Christ-like transformation. Come on, Bill. What seems to me like a shortcut is actually the long route. What seems like the shortcut, if, I just, if I, this situation would be different, I know I'd have so much greater faith. I would, I'd be so much more devoted. I'd be so much more single focused. I'd be, you fill in the blanks. I'd be so much better at what I do. If this person or this situation were changed, and it's just simply, 
not true because what God has put in your heart is a vision to become something significant that is wrapped up entirely in a journey that you walk with Jesus where you, me, become like him. And that can only be done being yoked together with people. It's sovereign, the sovereign God. I sometimes get accused lightly, sometimes not lightly, but sometimes lightly <laughs> accused for not believing strongly in the sovereignty of God. I feel like I do, uh, but I'm, I'm accused of that because I emphasize so much our responsibility. And I get it, I get it. The sovereignty of God is a huge thing. And I, I, I remember when our kids were small, you know, they'd be in Little League or a school teacher that was, you know, kind of challenging or whatever. And our approach was, we're not going to fight to change their environment. We're going to fight to equip them to thrive in that environment. Instead of insisting they have a different Little League coach, we just, you know, try to give them the tools the best we know how. This is, this is how you do this is how you deal with, I'm not, we're not bending our yellers, you know, we just don't holler and yell at each other or anyone, you know, unless somebody's on the other side of the yard, we need their attention, but, you know, we're just, we're, we don't have that kind of a makeup at all. And yet our kids would be in literally, you know, with this coach that just yells and screams and we just have to work with our kids, give them the tools to thrive in that environment. Does this make any sense to you? And so that's what we do is we, we are not trying to change the environment so everybody is safe. We're trying to change the everybody so they can influence their environment. And that really is the heart of God for us in this situation. So that's pretty much all I have to say today. We'll, we'll bring it up again when I can do it again. More thoroughly. Yeah, there are millions of people that would gladly take my biggest problem if they could also have my biggest privilege. Entitlement is a scary thing, and that's what blessing does, is it insulates us from the awareness that we carry of our need for one another. And so I just pray that over everybody in this room. I just pray that there's an unusual grace and a real clarity of sight, clarity of thought, so that there's a true, true celebration for the gifts of God. One of the things that I've, I've been doing is, is there'll be a... a a challenging situation. And I, I just take time to pray and to think and to ponder on the gifts and the strengths in their life. And, uh, and what I'll do is I'll just, I'll start giving thanks for specific things where normally it might be tempting for me to try to figure out how to change them. Yeah, a lot of times I'm the one that needs to change. And so what I'll do is I'll just think about what is it that I can give thanks for? What can I celebrate in that individual? When I say this, Obviously, all of us have people in our lives that are just out and out to get us. And, and I understand. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not pretending all is well in that environment. But most of us have conflict and problems with really good people. It's a mystery to us, I know. How can they be that good and cause me that much pain? And really, it's the getting up in the middle of the night, praying till there's a breakthrough, and you'll find that the yoke has been readjusted, and actually all that changed was you. So Father, I ask that today would, there'd be a great grace for this, a real great grace for this, to celebrate, to honor, to value the privilege that we have of being family, the privilege that we have of growing together. And we really do, bottom line, is we want to honor you above everything, where uh, where you're exalted by us becoming more like you and us truly caring for one another where it counts most. I ask this in Jesus' name. Um, also, if you could hold your places, that'll help me out here. I got a couple of minutes left. So um, There's always uh, a chance there's people here that don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. A friend of mine started just walking up to people randomly and asking them the question, are you a personal friend of Jesus Christ? And, uh, and it's just amazing how conversation starts at that point and how many people have come to the Lord simply because of that question. So I ask you that question. Are you a personal friend of Jesus Christ? That friendship, that intimacy, that closeness with God actually brings you into a position of being forgiven, brought into a family, simply made new, new from the inside out. It's available for everybody here. And if you are one that would say, Bill, I don't wanna leave the building, I don't wanna leave the property, 
until I know that I'm at peace with God, that I know that my friendship with Jesus has started. If that's anybody here, I want you just to put a hand up real quickly and say, Bill, that's me. I don't want to leave until that thing is settled. Put your hand up real fast. I want to make sure that I give ample time for it. And there's Bethel TV as well. Yeah. That over here is wonderful. Yep. Beautiful. Come on. It's the best thing ever. Yeah. And we so much love our Bethel TV family. My goodness, I travel around the world and, and you guys greet me all the time and with thankfulness for this. We honor you, we bless you. And I pray that there'd be the same breakthrough in household after house. In fact, what Chris prayed earlier for prodigals to return home, that it would come as a result of this invitation. Thanks for listening to the Sermon of the Week. This weekly podcast is being translated into multiple languages. Please visit podcasts.ibethel.org.